Good morning and welcome to Westside Baptist Church for Sunday School. Today is 25 October 2020 and we are in the second session of a series of seven about our commitment with Christ. And of course, he wants us to trust him and to obey him. What does it mean for us to commit to Christ? It means that when we want to do one thing, that we have to deny ourselves something else. Jesus, in Luke chapter 14, 28 through 33, asked us and the people that he was with to count the cost of serving him, obeying him, trusting him. <clears throat> and this is a sign of those, it's the difference between those of us that say we are committed to him versus those who actually are. <clears throat> so Jesus is going to use these scriptures to train and teach his disciples and he wanted them to embrace it out of love and gratitude for what he has done for us salvation and a life of serving him the scripture that we're using this morning is from Mark chapter 10 verse 13 through 22 Jesus was on his way with his disciples to the capital city. He was going back and he was using the time that he had and the opportunities to train and teach his disciples about what was going to happen uh, in the next few days. He was going to ride on a donkey. Uh, people were going to wave palm and they were uh, saying Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest to the king. And Jesus would choose the path of suffering and death for our sins. He wanted his disciples to understand the seriousness for total commitment. So let us pray. Our Lord and God, we again thank you that we can come to you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that you led a life without sin and that you shed your blood to pay for all of our sins, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you that you rose on the third day. You are the only living God. And Lord, now as we look into your word, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us, Lord, and we would learn more about who you are and about how we should trust you and obey you. And I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mark, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in chapter 10 and verse 13 through 16, said this, and they brought young children to him 
that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. Jesus was showing us that we need to trust him like a child does. Children help us grow in the Lord. When I think of, of this, I think of our friend Joe Merritt. His, his grandson asked him to come to church with him. And through the work of his grandson, Joe was saved and has, has been serving the Lord for many years now. Jesus wants us to enter the kingdom of God, but he wants us to enter it as a child, trusting him. <clears throat> Jesus was preparing his disciples for his death and his resurrection, as in Mark 8, verse 31. They had watched him teach and preach, and they didn't really understand until after his death what he was talking about. Jesus wanted to give these children a blessing, and the, and the disciples were scolding them and warning them, reprimanding them not to bother our Lord and Savior. And Jesus became displeased, very displeased. He was annoyed. He was dissatisfied with them. And they had never seen him like this, except for when he was talking to the religious leaders and called them vipers. <clears throat> there in Matthew 21, 15 and Luke 13, 14, but he was upset with them, and rightly so. He wanted the little children to come to him. He wanted to bless them. He wanted to touch them, and they wanted to be blessed by him. And even the parents of the children wanted him to bless them. And this was a teachable moment for the disciples to start to understand about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so the children gathered around uh, our Lord and Savior, and he told the disciples that they should understand that they must enter the kingdom like these little boys and girls who loved our Lord and trusted Him. It was a very simple trust in the Lord, and that's the way that we should be doing it. He wants us to live for Him. <clears throat> now, understand that little children can't take care of themselves. Someone has to give them food and shelter and clothing and the other things that they need in their life. 
and that's the way that they trust their mom and dad for these things. <clears throat> so they portray the heart of a person who's fit for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> They had complete trust in him, and that's the way that we should enter. They wanted to have the blessing from our Lord and Savior, and he was more than willing to give them that blessing. And in a way, the hands of our Lord and Savior have been laid on every person that has given his or her life to Jesus through that same simple childlike faith. Mark goes on in chapter 17 and verse 20 to tell the story about the rich young man. He was a ruler. Now, this is a true story. It is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Mark, chapter 17 through verse 20, the Bible says this. You remember that he was on his way to the capital city where he was going to be on the cross where he was going to shed his blood but he was still taking every opportunity to bless people to talk with them and to help them so mark says and when he was gone forth into the way there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him good master what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. When we strive to be obedient, we show complete commitment to Christ. So, what happened here? This was a young man. He was a ruler, and they usually did not run after anyone, and especially kneel to anyone. The Bible said he was rich. So this rich, young ruler had a genuine eagerness and humility as he came to Jesus. He called him good master. He knew that Jesus would be able to answer how he could have eternal life. And he was serious. He wanted to inherit eternal life. It seemed like he... He was desperate to receive it. Jesus said to him, uh, why do you call me good master? This word good at that time was not used very much by the Hebrew people. It was only used 
for God because only God is good. So maybe since he used that, since he knelt down, since he was running after him, he compared our Lord and Savior to God. That was a clear implication by what he did. Jesus then talked about the Ten Commandments, especially the last six, which refer to the way that we actually relate to other people. <clears throat> so, Jesus was speaking to him about what God required of us in order to be right with him. And because he talked about the Ten Commandments, the rich young ruler should have opened his eyes to his sin. He couldn't make himself right with God on his own. That's why we see the Ten Commandments and understand that there's no way that we can keep them. Jesus taught his believers that God gave the law so that we would see our need for Christ. There in Galatians chapter 3, 19 through 26. The rich young man testified that he had never broken any of the Ten Commandments. Instead of seeing his spiritual helplessness, he deceived himself. We all understand that we cannot keep all of the Ten Commandments. He didn't know the truth about what the Ten Commandments meant and what they were for. They were to show us that we can't keep them and we need to accept the free gift paid for by our Lord and Savior. Mark goes on in chapter 10 and verse 21 through 22, he was telling us about what happened with this rich young ruler. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad, sad at that saying, and went away grieved. He had great possessions. This young man wholeheartedly wanted eternal life. Jesus said that he loved this man and it wasn't just a small thing. This man came to him. He was very sincere and he was eager to have eternal life. But somehow he had missed it. Jesus loved him, and his love overflowed from the heart of God. He channeled it like a river of compassion for this man. This man had a misunderstanding. He was deceived. Jesus instructed the man to go and remove a serious block 
that was holding him back from accepting Christ as his Savior. He lacked the ability to see himself honestly, and it also prevented him from seeing our Lord and Savior very clearly. He told him to go and to sell whatever he had and turn it into money and give it to the poor. If the man followed Jesus' instruction, he would begin to embrace the truth about money. God intended for money to be a resource to be used as a tool, not an idol to be worshipped like a deity. He didn't understand that Jesus alone was everything that he needed. Jesus brought up storing treasure in heaven and talked about how to live as citizens in the kingdom of God in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth, doth corrupt. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We all know we can't take anything with us when we go to heaven. So the treasures that we have here on this earth should be a lower priority. Jesus should be our top priority. The man had come back to him, but he had not removed the obstacle that was blocking him. And he wanted to follow the Lord, uh, the Lord wholeheartedly as a disciple, and he should have been eager to grow with him. And to commit himself 100% to God. But the man did not remove the obstacle and come like a child to the Lord. He refused to remove the obstacle and he would not be able to make a total commitment to the Lord. This young man never dreamed it would involve complete surrender to Christ. I'm sure that he was shocked when he was told to sell everything. He finally turned his back on the invitation from the Lord because it cost him far too much. Having eternal life meant giving up his possessions. When we go to be with the Lord, our possessions don't matter. Some people think that uh, Jesus is calling us to a life of poverty but he is not. Jesus doesn't expect us to live in poverty in order to show that we fully trust him. He expects us to live in obedience to him. We need to ask the Lord 
to show us any obstacles that we need to eliminate so that we can fully trust in Him. So we can live without having our spiritual vision obstructed. Some people think that this is too much and requires an extreme an extreme measure. But Jesus is asking us to do nothing more than what he has done for us. Jesus was rich, but he became poor so that we could become rich in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. So how do we live this out? What is our commitment to Christ? First of all, we should trust and we should know that spiritually there's no way that we can make it on our own. We need to trust Christ and be obedient to his word and thank him for his grace and his love and the way that he takes care of us. We need to examine our hearts and look at things that may be causing us to not fully trust him. It might be money or power or comfort, control, safety, approval, or even recognition. Ask him to reveal those things to each of us so that we might rekindle our relationship with him. Write down some of the ways or things that have kept each of us from the childlike faith in God and ask him to help each of us return to that place again, back to our first love. This is not an easy thing, and we struggle with this in our everyday life, but we need to understand, we need to learn that we are to trust God, and we are to spend time growing in Him, and make a commitment to put Him first place in our lives. Let us pray. Father God, show us things in our lives that have become more important than following you and help us to put you above all things. Our Lord and God, we ask you again that we grow, that we learn, and that we commit ourselves to you. We know that we should be sharing your love with other people. We know that we should help those. We know that we should pray for and help those here in our church that have special needs, Lord. We ask that you would guide us and we would want to commit ourselves to being obedient to you. And I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.